This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today's guest felt the desire to write a book where culture and current issues intersect with biblical prophecy. Our guest is author Steve Miller, who says the global economy is a driving force in prophecy. Just a note, Steve is deaf. His wife Becky will be helping me by signing to Steve off camera. And I wanted to say thanks for helping us out with the interview. I'm probably old enough to, I am old enough to remember this. You, you may not be, but back in the 70s, the 1970s, uh, there was a lot of people that were into prophecy and eschatology predicting the future, telling people when Jesus would return, when the rapture would happen, when the end times are going to start. And that sort of fell out of favor with a lot of, a lot of Christians because people were setting dates and things weren't happening. Uh, how did you get interested today in putting out this book? Uh, well, I think one of the really important things, and I begin the book in this way, is that Christ, when he talked about the end times himself to his disciples, he told us three times that we need to keep watch, be alert, keep watch. And all three times in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, when he talked about keeping watch, he also said, you will not know the day or the hour of my coming. So he made it clear that we're not to set dates. He made it clear that there's no way for us to know when he will come. But the very fact that he encouraged us to keep watch does inform us that we should at least get to know the general season of his coming. And that was the whole subject of what he taught in Matthew chapter 24. We talked about the signs of his return. He gave enough uh, information for us to be able to look at what's going on around us and discern what's going on. And you're right. If we do try to set dates, people will get discouraged. And that's the last thing we want to do. It pushes people away from uh, God. What we need to say is that uh, Christ called us to keep watch and be faithful and do that. So the, uh, the emphasis of writing the book then is really to encourage believers that uh, we, we really need to be ready. And at the same time, we need to continue to live our lives as, as Christians. Yes, very much so. Uh, the Greek text behind the words keep watch simply mean ongoing expectancy. We, to have an ongoing expectancy simply means to be ready at all times, uh, as opposed to anticipating a specific point in time. So we ought to have this continual attitude. What's kind of interesting is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when Paul talked about the rapture to the Thessalonians, he said, encourage one another with these words. In other words, conversations about the rapture were an ongoing thing, even in the early church. And so God wants us to live with a sense of expect expectancy, a sense of excitement about Christ's return. But because we don't know when it's going to happen, we need to be faithful to be doing his work at all times. Well, let, let me read something to our audience here, because this is, I mean, if you don't think this is the news headlines, you're missing the news headlines. It's, uh, it's uh, 2 Timothy 3. It says, But I know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, ha haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying its powers, and from such people turn away. Does that sound like today's headlines to you? It does sound very much like today. And it's interesting you should pick that passage uh, because the very first three words in that passage are really key. It says men will be lovers of self. And the way that passage is constructed, every single one of those sins or those immoralities that you talked about after lovers of self comes out of that term lovers of self. So it's kind of like lovers of self is the spring from which the fountain of all those immoralities and all those sins and all that evil springs from. And it's interesting because being lovers of self goes all the way back to what Adam and Eve did in the garden. Mm -hmm. When they ate from the uh, tree, they were essentially saying, God, we love ourselves more than we love you. They put themselves first. And being a lover of self ultimately comes down to selfishness. 
And James 3.16 says that where we find selfishness, we will find every kind of evil. And as we look around us, we see selfishness is rampant. People think about themselves. Uh, self is more important than truth. And that's a very revealing sign to us that, yes, we are indeed drawing close to the last day. Yeah, so you, you have this as, as one of the clues, but you say you've got 12 mega clues, big clues, where you see the culture intersecting with, with, uh, with the, the scriptures. And uh, what, what are some of those mega clues? What, maybe we'll start with what you think is the biggest one right now that you see in, in the culture or in the world uh, uh, political well, scene. The, the first clue I mentioned in the book is globalism. Mm -hmm. That is a very big one. Globalism, uh, we are becoming a more interconnected world. The internet, social media, uh, technology, communication have all advanced to the point where we've become more networked than ever. We've become more interdependent than ever. And we're also looking at the phenomena of how major corporations like Apple, Tencent, Google, Facebook, tie us all together through their business platforms. So there's a sense in which we no longer identify just as Americans or Canadians or Brazilians or Australian, but we identify as users of Google or users of Apple or users of a certain bank. So we're used to thinking in terms of being people of a global community. Yeah. But globalism, the reason this is so crucial is the Bible tells us that ultimately in Revelation 13, 7, we're told that the Antichrist will have rule over all people, all nations, all languages. And for that to happen, there has to be a one world government. Mm -hmm. And there are organizations today, like the World Economic Forum, that say the problem with the world is not globalization, the problem is not that we're becoming more networked. The problem is that we do not have global governance. And so there's a very strong push for global models of governance where we all work together and we all uh, give up our individual uh, models of governance and instead do it globally. I would say that's one of the biggest ones right now. Yeah, and uh, there may be some people in our audience that don't understand what the World Economic Forum is and Klaus Schwab, who actually founded that. But uh, writing a book after the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, The Great Reset, uh, they meet in this World Economic Forum meets in Davos uh, annually, I think. And it is a convergence of people from all over the world who control most of the world's wealth, isn't it? Yes, it's true. Uh, what's interesting about the World Economic Forum, and I want to preface by saying that in the book, I make it clear that I do not point to organizations like the World Economic Forum as being the mm -hmm. path to the Antichrist. We can't predict that. Uh, I would not be surprised if there are several more major changes or revolutions or whatever you want to call them before we make the path to from here to there. But what's interesting is the mentality that the World Economic Forum promotes. I'll read from Klaus Schwab's book. You were just mentioning Klaus Schwab. The World Economic Forum, when COVID-19 hit, they said world governments are too splintered. They're all responding to it in different ways. This is not good. And they said, COVID-19 revealed a failure of global governance and leadership. And they jumped on this to say, if we want to achieve a better outcome for the future, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economy, from education to social contracts and working conditions. Every country from the United States to China must participate in every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. And if you look at the language there, the word must, mm -hmm. all, every, must, every, must, those all sound like imperatives and like command. So the mentality is we need to work together. We need to be a global community. And because the World Economic Forum doesn't work within borders like the United Nations does, the United Nations works within borders. It works within country. The World Economic Forum transcends all that. And it has very powerful people, very wealthy people, who are the ones who are shaping what they believe our world should do in the future. Yeah, and, and a response to that, I think, was the, the treaty that, uh, that lots of countries were signing with the World Health Organization, which gave them the, uh, the power to go into any country, if they, if they declared a pandemic or an endemic, to go into any country 
over and above that country's government and say, this is what you need to do to fight this, this pandemic or whatever it is, including locking people down and, and shutting businesses down. But there was a treaty with the World Health Organization. And I think it came out of this whole mindset of the Great Reset. Yes, you're correct about that. It's interesting, the World Health Organization, the top people in the World Health Organization are connected with the World Economic Forum. And interestingly enough, top people in our own government, top people in other government, top people in high tech company, top people in uh, media, top people in no matter where you look, top people, you weave it all back and you'll find that they share a common mindset. They are part of the World Economic Forum. They all have the mindset that we need to be a global community. Uh, so this does hold a lot of sway. It does hold a lot of power. And it's frightening to think what you were just saying about all the countries of the world yielding their sovereignty on health issues mm -hmm. and saying, World Health Organization, you make all the call. But that's the mentality that's being promoted, not just in health, but now we're looking at the economy. Now we're looking at energy issues. Now we're looking at food issues. Yeah. You, you think, uh, this is kind of an aside, that uh, th a lot of, and I, when I say these people, but a lot of the people involved in these things are really looking for more immortality. They're looking for a way to extend their, their, their life or their power that uh, somehow the rest of the world isn't smart enough or strong enough or wealthy enough to do that, but this group of people could maybe become immortal. Do you think there, <laughs> there's, a, there's an idea in the back of their head that I want to extend my life th by doing these things? You know, I think that's an interesting thought. Uh, it's hard to know where they are mentally. They don't say a lot along those lines. But I think some clues we can look at that fit with what you're suggesting here. One clue is that man has always sought to be immortal. Mm -hmm. Man has sought to overcome death somehow. We've always been looking for ways to extend our lives. And now we're looking at modern technology and even artificial intelligence mm -hmm. as possible ways of extending life. And now we're already talking about transhumanism, where we integrate technology in the human body. And you can't help but think, what motivates us to investigate artificial intelligence and transhumanism as the answer, the motivation is our desire to be immortal. After the break. Where the government has total power over what the people can and cannot do. And the more power that we yield to a government, the more powerful the government becomes. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Our guest is author Steve Miller, who says the global economy is a driving force in prophecy. And th this may be another one of your mega clues, is that there, there is a, I hate to even label people, but an, an elite, elite group of people and then the rest of us. 
And do you see that, that rising up of the elite as one of your clues? Uh, I talk about that within the book itself, yeah. And I appreciate you saying that you hate to label people as elitist and then there's the rest of us. Whether it's intentional or not, it is essentially basically what's happening. I don't know how familiar you might be with Victor Davis Hanson, but Victor Davis Hanson recently wrote a book called The Dying Citizen. And the whole concept of that book is that there are forces happening in our world today that are pushing out the whole concept of middle class, they're pushing out the whole concept of individual citizenship. And instead, our world is becoming very polarized. We're seeing a very powerful elite that decides what we uh, need to do in order to save the world, in order to prolong uh, what goes on in our world. And, and I, when I say that, I think of the World Economic Forum's website. You go into the World Economic Forum's website, and every problem that the world faces today that you can think of, they have a plan, they have a blueprint on their website that says, here's how this needs to be tackled, here's how this needs to be done. And when Klaus Schwab spoke to the World Economic Forum at this year's summit, he said, we in this room have the power to make these things happen, is how he put it. We in this room. Whether that's intentional or not, that communicates, yes, there's those of us who aren't smart enough, who aren't wealthy enough to have a say in this. Yeah, and that brings up an, another point when they say, we in this room have the power to make this happen. Uh, if anybody disagrees with, with what they want to happen, or anybody disagrees with the Great Reset, or if you have a tendency to disagree with those in power now, you automatically become evil or a hater or an uh, insurrectionist. Uh, you can't, there is no discourse. You can't disagree with those in power today. Yes, very much so. And that falls in this whole line of thinking on disinformation. Disinformation has become a big word these days, uh, especially in relation to the media. So we see the media who are connected at the hip with the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. The media are saying, uh, this is the narrative people need to hear. This is the message people need to hear. Those of you who disagree need to be silenced. We need to be selective about what gets out there in social media. Even the, the Prime Minister in New Zealand last year, when uh, COVID was still having a ravaging effect on New Zealand, she said, we will be your source of truth. Your government will be your source of truth. And, and so here in the United States, we recently had an attempt to set up a disinformation governance board, which didn't start off very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. Uh, the rumblings are still there. The desire is still there to make it so that if you disagree, you're going to be silenced. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know whether uh, uh, Orwell was a Christian or a believer. I, I'm not sure. He, maybe he wasn't. I don't know. I don't want to judge him. But the, the book 1984, I mean, it, it just reads like a, a roadmap to what we're seeing today. Yes. And uh, I think the reason Orwell was able to think the way he does was he was able to see up close what communism and socialism were doing to the people of his day in his country. Uh, he was able to see up close what the consequences of it would be. And it's not a hard stretch to take what, okay, if you have to, to get with the program in communism or in socialism, uh, communism and socialism, what looks so appealing about them if they say, we have the answers, and if you jump on board, you can be part of something that transforms and changes the world. That's what makes communism and socialism so appealing. But communism and socialism ultimately strip people of their identity because they say that everyone has to be in line with it. Everyone has to think together. We all have to get with the program. We have to all follow the same narrative. So no one's allowed to think differently. No one's allowed to be disparate in their thinking. And... We in America, we have a hard time seeing that because we've lived with freedoms of speech. We've lived with the freedom of thought for so long. But I think one of the most fascinating uh, phenomena taking place today is that people who formerly lived in Cuba, people who formerly lived in Venezuela, people who formerly lived in the former Eastern Bloc uh, countries in Europe, uh, people who formerly lived in Russia, who are living here in America today, are warning us and they're saying what happened in my country is happening here now. 
you don't see it, but my goodness, I am so worried. And that should be a warning sign to us. Yeah, when you're talking like uh, the totalitarian governments that you'd mentioned, you know, communist and, and socialist in some of these countries, uh, we, we always saw that as, I guess in the case, as the enemy of, of our, our way of life. Yet it seems like we're adopting all of that totalitarian government uh, uh, way of thinking, especially when you see uh, the media and ho big tech and Hollywood uh, doing the work of bringing on the totalitarian government by canceling people and and uh, kind of wiping out their their email and everything else that that all of a sudden we've got uh, organizations and companies and corporations doing the work of pushing totalitarian government on us. Yes, that says it very well. We do have companies, we do have leaders who are pushing this kind of thing. Now, of course, they're making it look good. They're making it look appealing. We would look at ourselves and say, oh, we would never uh, do what is happening in China, where, for example, you have the uh, imprisonment of the Uyghurs, the Muslim minorities in Northwest China, well, we would never do what Russia has done, where we would invade the sovereignty of another country like Ukraine. And so we look at the negative side of communism or socialism and say, well, we would never do that. But ultimately, what we have to realize is that what makes communism and socialism distinctive is that both are forms of government that are top down, mm -hmm. where the government has total power over what the people can and cannot do. And the more power that we yield to a government, the more powerful a government becomes. By default, that society ends up being pushed onto a path toward totalitarianism. And as we look at what's happening in America today, COVID-19 mm -hmm. gave our governments greatly expanded power. And we look at what's happening with school board today, the controversy over whether parents should be training their children about certain things, or teachers should be training their children about certain things. Government decides what education does. Government decides what banks do. Governments decide what energy companies do. The more we yield our decisions to government after what happened, the more totalitarian a country becomes. Yeah, I, I, I think we can look at history and look at what's happening right now that once the government gets power over a certain area, like we, we, gave, we, we gave power to the government in, in the, the whole thing with COVID, once they get that power, they don't normally give it back. That's exactly right. Uh, you look back at history, governments really give up power once they take them. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is amazing in that way. And, and we see it happening over and over that uh, whether it's state governments, federal governments, uh, local governments, like you, you said, with, with school boards, once they get a certain amount of power, they think it's theirs, their power to, to, to wield. And what we saw with COVID, I think, was that uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't something we gave the government, it's something we took and we didn't, nobody said, no, you can't do that. We, they just took it, uh, not legislatively, but they just took the power. You're right. They did just take it. Something interesting happened there, though. With COVID-19, COVID is a beautiful example. People were afraid. They were afraid of this virus that they never heard about. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to get it. And at first, the impression was that it was a very deadly virus. So people were all crying out to their government saying, help us. We need to figure this out, come up with a solution. So governments, of course, took advantage of that. As you say, governments will take the initiative anyway to expand their power. But basically the transaction that we saw take place here was governments were saying, okay, we will give you the security and we will give you the protection that you are asking us to give you. But in order to do that, we're gonna to have to ask you to give up some of your freedom. Mm -hmm. And that is the pattern that we are gonna see with future crises, energy crisis, food crisis, whatever the crisis is. People are saying we need help we need protection, we need security, and people will be willing to give those, uh, give up their freedoms in order to get those securities and protections that the governments can promise them. And in making that happen, all we do is we basically entrust the government with more power. Yeah, we, we, we turn to the government 
uh, I'm not sure as many Christians are turning to prayer anymore. We seem to we seem to turn to the government for all the answers, and the government usually has answers that don't really fit our best interest. What in 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 view of all this, what what should Christians be doing when we look at the government? Do we we can't just revolt? Uh, what what should Christians be doing? A couple of things. One is, it's interesting that scripture very clearly states that we should be praying for a governing authority. So yes, we should pray for them. And I think one of the more interesting things, there may be some of us, there may be some uh, people in your audience who are familiar with that. They know Christians who work in government. And those Christians who work in government realize the precarious situation they're in. They don't agree with what's going on around them. They don't agree with the decisions that are being made. And yet they're Christians. They're in a place where they can be salt and light within a very worldly environment. And that's a challenge. And I think as we pray for our governments, we need to be praying that they understand that the responsibilities they have were delegated to them by God. But what's tragic is that as governments advocate the responsibility God gives them, they end up drifting further away from God and they end up becoming more anti-God in nature. And it's interesting that when we look at history, if we look at uh, the persecution of Christian people, all of the worst forms of persecution came from governments. But we need to be praying for our government. Uh, that's a command in scripture. And the second thing is we need to be salt and light. We need to be the example that we can be. Now, if government tells us to do something that we shouldn't do, Scripture does give us principles for, yeah, we can disregard what government has told us. A beautiful example is Daniel, when uh, the uh, leaders of the Babylonian kingdom went to Nebuchadnezzar and said, we want all people to pray to you only. They made that a law. But Daniel disobeyed that law. He still went back to his room. He opened his window and faced Jerusalem and he prayed to the Lord. And that was a disobedience to the government, Daniel himself. Um, and then in uh, Acts, in the book of Acts, when John and Peter preached the gospel, the Sanhedrin arrested them, say, do not be preaching this. And they said, who do we listen to? You are God. So there will be points in our lives where our faith becomes the point at which we have to make a decision. Do we follow God or do we follow man? Foreshadowing, 12 mega, mega clues that Christ returning. We know that it's in the future. It may be today, but uh, where can we get the book? Well, there's a couple places you can go. Uh, first would be my website, stevemillerresources.com. Uh, there you'll find links to where the book can be bought. Or you could go to Amazon. You could go to ChristianBookDistributors.com. Uh, there are a number of places where the book can be obtained online. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. 